Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I will have a complimentary, a complimentary uh, approach to what you just have heard. My, maybe if you leave it on the table, this is, is, is better. <laughs> um, my background is social sciences. I am studying and have worked in a field called the Social Studies of Science and Technology. So I've been looking and researching what scientists do, how they communicate, how the science system functions, and one part of what we do, of course, is to look at the way how science communicates with the public, what kind of tensions arises, and how science and society get along, uh, depending on funding, on goodwill. This is the one side. On the other side, there are expectations and aspirations in society that only science can fulfill. What I want to do is to take you through four points in my, uh, in, in my little speech here. First, I want to give you a kind of state-of-the-art overview. Uh, we have been, we, uh, the STS community, have been looking at what is happening in this communication process. And we have moved some way from the idea that there is something called public understanding of science, which is to be promoted. At the origin of this idea was uh, the scientists believe if we only inform the public, the public will understand and the public will support us. Now it has turned out that the public is neither interested nor capable of absorbing all the fascination that drive scientists. But also that the public, and particularly some groups in the public, are very much capable of getting the knowledge that is needed if it is of particular concern to them. We have a number of patients groups that have quite sophisticated knowledge about the diseases, the origins, the conditions that their relatives and family members have, and they work together with researchers in order to help to understand the condition better and also to facilitate the life of those who are afflicted. So, and I can cite other examples. So we have moved from what used to be called the public understanding of science to something that is now called the public engagement with science. And engagement takes two sides. This has already been mentioned. Communication is always a two-way process. You have to listen to the other, be capable of putting yourself, as Richard also explained, putting yourself into the position of those who is on the other side. We have also learned that the public is not one monolithic group, but that there are publics of different kinds and different shades, and the publics also vary. Some publics come in to the scientific controversial debate, and some move out, some are invited to participate in the many fora that have been set up to get a better understanding of what motivates people, and others have not done so. But, and this is the, the major lesson that one can draw from a lot of empirical research that has been done uh, on this, and I think here we can say we are firmly stepping in the, tradition, in the tradition of the Enlightenment. Since the Enlightenment, we believe that there is explanatory knowledge and technology available that continues to increase, that allows us to have a vaster reach and understanding of the world, be it uh, the universe, be it the world of nature in general, be it the social world, and this explanatory knowledge, together with technology, is going to be expanded. And this is something that unites both the scientists and those who are not scientists. Technology comes in right from the beginning. Einstein famously said, my pencil and I are more clever than I. And if you put the computers we have now instead of Einstein's pencil, 
if you look at the apps that you all have on your mobile phones, you can understand this vast expansion of explanatory knowledge that we have now literally at our fingertips. So let us not overlook the fact that there is technology that is able to transform all the knowledge, the dense knowledge that goes into your technology uh, and put it at the reach of many more people. This was the dream of the Enlightenment. In the 18th century, the literacy rate in Europe at the age of the Enlightenment was in the order of 5%. And today we have the most educated population ever in, in history. And so um, my first conclusion of giving you this sketchy overview is that indeed in the spirit of an enlightenment that is unfinished certainly, but that needs to continue, uh, we have made enormous progress and the progress we have made is to bring many more people on board offering them something, but we have to make sure that they have access to it. We have to make sure that our educational system continues to evolve and not get stuck somewhere at levels that are way below what science and technology have to offer today. The second point is something that continues to be an irritant when science and the public meets. It comes up whenever there are controversies, and it's always interesting to deconstruct controversies, to lift the lid, to look into and to open the black box of what we take for granted, because this is what a controversy allows you to do. Something that you took for granted is not taken for granted anymore. And once you look into what happens, why does a controversy erupt? you find very different things. Sometimes it can be vested economic interests. When I was a professor at ETH Zurich, at the time when the so-called uh, GMO controversy, and you know the Swiss like to take public votes on lots of things, so the referendum was just standing uh, in front of the scientist's door, the Swiss uh, pharmaceutical industry had already made plans to move across the border into Germany if the referendum would be negative for them. It was interesting to see that the most ardent supporters of the scientists were patient groups with diseases for which there was no cure. But it was also interesting to see that in the same country, Switzerland, you had a different attitude in the French-speaking part and in the German-speaking part. And in the German-speaking part, the kind of uh, averseness to GMOs was linked to the way how the agriculture, which played a large economic role, was run in the German-speaking part, which was not the case in the French-speaking uh, part. So, but behind these controversies, very often, and this is the real irritant, is the question of the autonomy of science. And here, uh, how can we communicate, uh, and this is something that I think is of extreme importance, how can we in, uh, communicate the absolute necessity that science research in order to proceed needs its own space of autonomy. And the way how, um, and, and I've written another book on curiosity, and I think the way forward is to try to explain that what drives science and scientists is curiosity. Curiosity, and all parents know this, is something the children are born with. Then later on, when they happen, must go to school, something happens in school and all parents wonder, you know, what happens to my curious child now that it has entered this institution? So this is something that everyone understands because it is something that we are born with, that we have in us. And this curiosity as the main driving force holds for science as much as for the arts. And both science and arts need a space of autonomy 
because with curiosity you do not you do not know where you will end up curiosity cannot tell you in advance what will come out of it at the same time no society in history nor in the present can afford itself to say this is something where we grant you absolute absolute freedom absolute autonomy no society is able to do that and of course the conditions that are being posed vary enormously we have moved a long time from the 18th century the beginning of modern science when it was up to the church authorities and the monarchs of the day to censor what academy, uh, scientific ac academies were writing to each other this was part of the censorship so we have moved a long way from there but the conditions vary and in a sense you can say each society tries to tame curiosity but we must make sure that the conditions are such that science continues to have its space of autonomy and the way how this taming happens is uh, you, you can see it reflected in the kind of discourses we have we have had a risk discourse this is one way of trying to tame what scientists do and trying to somehow regulate constrict what might come out of it even if you don't know what will come out of it there is the moral discourse the most difficult of them all and i will not go into uh, examples here but we know of the instances where uh, moral um, absolutes are invoked <clears throat> that do not stand up to scrutiny because we know all values are values that change also in the course of history and uh, the, a, a third reason why we must be very careful in looking at the conditions under which this uh, autonomy is being uh, cut uh, and regulated and tamed is that after all if you are too strict the society will kill the goose that lays the golden eggs so if none of the other arguments uh, are taken up this is one that might be heard now let me move to the third point um, very quickly I mentioned the risk discourse as something that has also shown to be one of these irritants starting with the nuclear power controversy way back in the 70s and uh, I have followed part of this discourse and it was very obvious that both sides had something to learn from it as with every controversy if you really listen to the other side you learn something what we learned then was that the simple formula that was the standard formula you calculate uh, the risk by taking the size of the damage and you multiply it by the probability of the event that this covers only one part of what people were concerned with and in the course of the controversy it turned up that it makes a huge difference whether you think you are subjected to risk or whether you are voluntarily accepting the risk and there are other examples of this kind that no one thought about it before and uh, afterwards it seemed very obvious the time I think has come to move beyond the risk discourse towards perhaps it should be called the innovation discourse emphasizing the benefits because I think what we are doing when we speak about risk is really to confuse the term risk with the concept of danger risks can be calculated you may disagree about the calculations you may say you have to factor in for whom are benefits for whom are the risks so there are all kinds of complicated and rather sophisticated calculations to be done while danger means you can not calculate because you do not know what uh, what you are heading towards and the concept of risk again is an old one from the 13th century 
first insurance of cargo sent across the Mediterranean. You were insuring against the risks of the cargo getting lost, but in case the cargo arrived, you had a benefit. And this is the other side of the risk that we tend to lose sight of. So it's the benefits, the potential benefits, uh, because we are speaking about a future bet. And I think this is something where an innovation discourse, without falling into the trap of hype, into the trap of promising too much, for nothing is worse than if the public reminds you of the promises that you made yesterday that are nowhere to be near fulfillment today. My fourth and last point concerns the future. Where do we go from here? And uh, here I would like to say that in many of the um, many activities that scientists have been undertaking to communicate with the public, very often what stands at the forefront is what uh, François Jacob called the day science the glorious side, the successful results. And François Jacob has reminded us there's also the night side of science. The night side, when you are uncertain, when you have had some failures in your experiments, and there is no way to avoid uh, failures in what you are doing. Research means you are treading in the territory of the unknown, and you are not just stringing one success to the next, but there are failures in between. You have to make one step backwards in order to make the next one forward. And this night science is something that I think needs to be better communicated to the public, letting the public also participate in terms of the actual processes of research not just the outcome that you can present in these wonderful brochures, in festivals, in the kind of events that are being staged, but the actual process of how to do research and what happens, the fascination also when you are driven by curiosity, when it is passion that drives you to make the next step. Now, one um, movement that I see that goes in that direction has been called, sometimes there are different names, but it has also been called citizen science. And what is meant by citizen science are various attempts to enroll members of the public, youngsters, but also older people, who are participating in networked discoveries. A lot of it is done through the social media, through technologies of various kinds. Um, there are examples like uh, the folded experiment, one particular protein whose uh, exact folding structure was not unknown, has been, with the help of a kind of trout discovery mechanism, been solved. There is the Galaxy Zoo, which does similar things for uh, astronomy and so on. And there is a thriving and very promising um, movement in discovery games, scientific discovery games that are shared with young people in particular who then participate. The younger generation is certainly one that is the most important for the future. But I think this kind of enrollment and uh, moving on with citizen science will only be uh, taking us as far as it can if at the same time we allow more of our institutions to take into account the actual experience that people have. When we speak about regulating whatever comes up as a potential scientific discovery, we shy away from taking into account the experience that people have. And John Stuart Mill, way back already in, in the 18th century, when he spoke about ethics, he spoke about experimental living and that there should be space for allowing experimental living. So in this sense, I hope we make a tiny step forward in the promotion 
but also in the communication towards this common experimental living that we enjoy with science and technology. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.